Okay, I think we're live. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to the WIN Summer Seminar Series again. Uh, today we're hosting uh, the amazing Chris uh, Baldassano from Columbia University. Um, so a few words about Chris. Chris got his PhD uh, in computer science at Stanford, uh, applying machine learning to study the human visual system with Fei-Fei Li and Dan Beck before becoming a postdoc at Princeton, working with Uri Hasson and Ken Norman, uh, doing some really amazing work, which I think we're going to hear some about today and the uh, follow-ups. Uh, he's now assistant professor at Columbia University, and um, he's going to uh, tell us about uh, work that I think is exciting, both in terms of the analysis methodology and uh, the scientific questions that he's asking. So uh, we're very happy to have Chris here today. Um, before we start, um, I'll just remind you of the control feature of uh, features of Crowdcast. So on the right hand side of the screen, there is a chat where you can ask um, any question you uh, like or that you think that the members of the audience might be able to help you with. Um, no question is too stupid for the chat, so ask away. Uh, you can also paste uh, relevant links or just uh, show your enthusiasm to Chris's talk. Um, if you want to address a question to Chris, um, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll be monitoring that, and um, uh, I'm also encouraging you to vote on questions uh, down there in the Ask a Question button because uh, I will be asking, or I'll, I'll invite people to ask the top voted questions uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, or I can also ask the, talk, the question for you if you prefer not to go on the screen. So um, with that, um, Chris, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much. All right. All right, great. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is my first time doing something on this platform, but um, I'm super excited for able to do this. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a lot of my lab's recent work on schemas, um, different kinds of schemas and how they develop. And to give you some idea of, of what a schema is, um, I'm going to give you a taste of what the world would be like if you didn't have schemas. Um, so I'm going to show a, a, this is just a brief clip from a video game tournament. and. Um, I assume for most of you, you haven't seen this video game before. I just would like you to just watch um, and try to understand and remember what's going on. Here comes the Echo Slam. Where's well, it going to be enough or not yet? The fissure is out. Necro Control is a nice oldie from Moogie. Maybe the regenerate is enough miracle. The Agency mod will pop faith. Able to shackle him forever. Holding him. Up they come once more. No Hex, no Instant Son of Babel. Only Slash on top of Moogie. The Shrines are doing enough and end all the miracle Joe. So there was a lot happening there. Um, you might have heard the crowd going wild at the end. Um, but if you haven't seen this game before, that probably was just pretty baffling to watch. Um, didn't have any sense of um, what the goals of the players were, where on the screen you were supposed to be looking. Um, you didn't understand the white, what are the dynamics of what's going on, um, right? And so uh, there's been a lot of research about that the way that we understand at least natural real life events relies a lot on our prior knowledge about how the world works. Uh, so people have been interested in this for a long time. So um, for example, there were some studies in the 70s looking at um, trying to figure out what these kinds of event schema schemas that people have are. Um, the specific kind of schema they were looking at in this 1979 paper, uh, they called a script, meaning that it's a pretty temporarily ordered sequence of things, for example, that happens when you go to a restaurant. Um, there could be more complicated versions of these scripts too. For example, um, this is a version of the restaurant script that has kind of branches to it that when you uh, order something from the menu, they might not have it. And so you have to go into a loop of asking for other things on the menu. Um, but so the idea is that as we are um, building up models of what's going on in the world around us, this depends not only on what's currently coming in through our sensory system, but also on this big library of uh, schemas that we've built up over our lives. Um, some of these can um, be related to social situations and the kind of particular social interactions uh, in whatever culture you're in. Um, they could be also be related to things um, just about temporal dynamics in the world. Um, so I'm really interested in how we build up these schemas, um, how they influence our current understanding of the world, 
and how these models that we build end up getting stored into long-term memory. Um, one of these questions I'm interested in is where we get these schemas from. So one possibility is that we're taught them explicitly. So uh, for example, my kids have these Maisie books. Um, so there's this Maisie goes on a plane book where there's absolutely no plot. Maisie just has a totally stereotypical airport experience. Um, and obviously the goal of these books is to help kids feel comfortable in new situations by teaching them what the schema is and what the pieces are gonna be. Um, but I think the much more common way to learn about schemas is simply through experience, right? So all the people watching uh, that video game tournament that were cheering in the background, they probably hadn't taken a class on this game or studied it from a textbook. Um, what they had done is watched many games and extracted through them, what are the kinds of things that happen? What are the important things that happen? What should I pay attention to? Uh, so this tells us that there's actually a loop here that um, our episodic memories over time get built up into these schemas which then influence our later perception and memory. Um, and so this kind of loop is also very interesting to me. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about a number of different projects in a few different categories. Um, I'm first gonna talk about these kinds of event, scre event schemas or event scripts that have to do with narratives and sort of everyday events. Um, then I'll talk about some projects we're doing now about how to teach people new kinds of schemas that um, are novel so we can manipulate them in the lab but they still have this kind of naturalistic rich structure. Um, and finally, thinking about how we could learn these events, uh, these kind of event schemas over the course of years during development. Um, so I, I should preface all this by saying that many of the things I'm gonna talk about are not finished. So many of these sections uh, are ongoing work where um, I'm gonna end with some questions that we have some ideas about, and I'd be happy to talk about um, during the question period. But um, for many of these things, there's not gonna be a final conclusion slide. Um, we're, yeah, we're, we're somewhere between sort of uh, barely started and, and almost finished for all of these projects. Okay, so first um, I'll talk about narrative event scripts. Um, so this was a, a project um, that uh, as I was finishing up my postdoc, I ran at Princeton where um, we showed people a bunch of different stories and these stories uh, all uh, came in one of two flavors. So there were restaurant stories where people would go through a sort of typical restaurant experience or airport stories of people boarding a plane. Um, so although these stories conform to one of these two schemas, we tried to make them as different and possible as possible in every other dimension. So some were movies, some were audiobooks. Um, the characters are different, the types of narratives are different. So some are uh, like rom-coms, some are thrillers. Um, and so we tried to make the, the stories themselves as different as possible, but we edited them so that they all conform to the same kind of sequence of events. Uh, so for example, in the airport category, um, there's this clip from Night and Day. Um, Cameron Diaz is going up this escalator uh, while Tom Cruise, Cruise is watching her. Um, she goes through security. Um, she's rushing to make her flight and finally sits down on the plane. Um, we had another movie, as is from Due Date, um, there's a conversation as they're going in the terminal, they go through security, um, again, going down the concourse and finally uh, taking their seats, right? So there's this same kind of script that's being followed in both of these movies. Um, we didn't divide it up like this in the, in the clips that we showed people, right? They're just watching a continuous about three minute movie clip. So um, one of the main analyses we were interested in here is are there brain regions that have some kind of schematic patterns, meaning that they have the same representation for each of these schematic events within uh, these stories that conform to this schema. So um, for example, right, this visualization is showing that for each of these about three minute stories, um, we can divide them up into these four pieces. Um, and what we can do is look at two stories that um, come from the same schema. So two restaurant stories, for example, um, and then look at the average um, pattern of activity in some brain region during each of these four events. And what we wanna see is, are there brain regions uh, for which this pattern of activity is similar um, for events that come from the same schema? Um, and so what we found is that there's actually a, number, a large number of regions that have this property. Um, and specifically, most of them are focused in what are traditionally called default mode regions. Um, these are regions that at least traditionally were thought not to be involved that much in sensory perception. Um, but we think are actually critical for these kinds of really stable long-term representations um, and are really uh, heavily engaged in these kinds of naturalistic stimuli. Um, so specifically some regions I'll, I'm gonna be talking about 
frequently today. One is the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and this other back piece here is um, sometimes I call it posterior medial cortex, or uh, this is sort of around pecunius and posterior cingulate. Um, so some of these regions here, right, they have these patterns that generalize across stories that um, have the same schema. Okay, so this is just during perception of these movies and stories. Um, we're all interested, I'm also interested in the role of these schemas at recall, at, uh, when we're trying to remember the stories later. Uh, so in this experiment, what we did is um, after people watched or listened to all of these 16 stories, they stayed in the scanner and tried to recall all 16 of them. So they don't get any prompt, they just get the title of the story and then um, they can say as much as they want. Uh, so for example, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna play a short clip of, uh, of someone's recall. Um, the, you'll hear the audio is a little bit noisy because we're recording this in the scanner while it's running. Attractive blonde actress is ascending an escalator while a creepy short man named Tom Cruise is watching from a balcony nearby. So we have these uh, these recalls from all of our subjects. Um, people are willing to talk for quite a while. So um, we have the, the recalls are, are maybe on average about as half as long as the original stories were. Um, so this project we've been working on for a number of years now, um, it's being uh, led by this great uh, graduate student at Princeton, Rolando Maciso Pondo. Um, and the goal was to figure out um, do we see the same kind of schematic patterns at recall as we saw during perception? Um, so it's a little bit tricky to, to think about what to do with these recall time series. They're not, um, they're, these are just free recalls. And so the rate at which people go through the events of these stories is just controlled by the subject. Um, so one approach that we've been, been taking with these, uh, these recall time series um, is to apply a hidden Markov model. Um, and so the full details about this are, um, or in my 2017 paper, but um, the basics of this model is that it assumes that any narrative stimulus causes the brain to go through a sequence of discrete events, and that each of these events has some kind of uh, dis some kind of distinct multi-voxel pattern of activity in a brain region, um, right? And so, critically here, we think that when you go through a story, either during perception or during recall, um, you're going to go through this same sequence of event patterns, and um, we can try to identify this sequence, right, and look for brain regions that have this, uh, that have the same kind of sequence at recall as they do during perception, right? That would indicate that the sequence is basically being replayed during recall, right? As people are talking about the story, um, they're going back and reliving the same sequence of patterns as during perception. Um, if you'd like to, to uh, try this, there's a, um, this is implemented in the Brainiac toolbox. Um, there's also a uh, tutorial we put together for OHBM that's that's freely available as well that I can um, I can send in the in the comments maybe. Um, so I'm going to show an example of applying this model. So um, this is using activity patterns from posterior medial cortex. Um, this is going to be you're going to hear someone's uh, recall of their uh, recalling the a movie clip from the uh, the movie Brazil, and um, we have these these hidden Markov models that are trying to figure out both which schema you're in, uh, which story you're in, and which event within that schema and story you're in. Uh, so the colors here are showing model probabilities. So the bright yellow is showing where the model thinks you are, both in terms of the schema and in terms of the specific story. Um, and the dotted lines here show roughly what the person is actually talking about. Right? So the dotted, the dotted black lines show roughly the ground truth of where we are. Uh -huh is wearing like a cheetah print and has like a cheetah print silhouette on her head. Goes to uh, um, a French restaurant with her son and meets up with some of her older friends. And they're all dressed really weird and have a lot of colors on. And um, her son really wants to talk to her, but she's ignoring him. And they're all ordering on a menu. And it's like an electronic menu. And the waiter forces the son to order steak. And then when it comes, it's like these green circular entrees. And the son's still trying to talk to the mom, but the mom's talking to her friend about her like Botox treatment or something. And they're talking about different surgeons and um, they begin eating. So what I hope you could see in this example is that uh, we, we can use this hidden Markov model to estimate the probability that 
you're in a particular event, um, both in terms of which story they're talking about, as well as this overall schema, right? And so in, in brain regions like uh, like this one, like the posterior medial cortex, there's some information about both of these things, both which specific story you're in, as well as part of the pattern generalizes across other restaurant stories as well. Um, so we can look across the brain to see which regions we can do this kind of tracking with the hidden markup model. Um, so when trying to track story specific features, meaning um, activity patterns, that uh, the sequence of activity patterns that's specific to this particular narrative, um, we again see these default mode regions as well as some other regions um, on the in lateral temporal and lateral parietal lobes. Um, and when we try to do this tracking for schemas, we also again find a similar set of regions um, which uh, also includes some of these more dorsal parts of the medial parietal lobe. Um, and so there's uh, a lot of other pieces to this project. Um, we're also, in addition to this question of how these this reinstatement comes back during recall, um, we're also interested in how these measures relate to behavior. So we actually have several measures of behavior in terms of um, both the extent to which people are using story specific details and the extent to which they're talking generally about the correct schema. Um, and so we have a, a number of analyses trying to relate these neural measures to behavior as well. So um, in these experiments, we designed these stimuli so that there really was only a single relevant script. Um, there were episodic details that were on top of that script, but there was really only one set of dynamics that was going on. Um, but in real life, you're, when you're uh, experiencing things, there might be multiple scripts happening at the same time. And in fact, that's probably the more common situation is that um, there's lots of things going on and you have to decide to some extent what kind of scripts you're going to activate. Um, so for example, you can imagine a, a story about someone going grocery shopping. And so there's a script of what should happen when you go grocery shopping. Um, but maybe during maybe the story is also about um, a, a couple meeting for the first time, right? So. This is like a right. There's like a romantic comedy story going on here that's happening at the same time as the grocery ordering. Um, and so, a question here is: To what extent are these uh, these patterns that are coming out of these schemas that we're seeing in the brain? Um, to what extent do they depend on this top-down modulation of the active schema? Right. So, can we actually, by pushing people to use one of these scripts over the other, can we change something both about their brain activity and about their behavior? Uh, so there's a uh, my lab manager in my lab, Alexander Roblando, um, constructed this really interesting experiment. And so um, this is uh, what she did is created these 16 stories where every story has uh, has an overlapping has two overlapping scripts in it. Uh, so there's eight scripts total, and we sort of, we cross them to get these 16 different stories. Um, so these are uh, these are all audio stories that um, that people can listen to in the scanner and um, for each of them, again, there you could uh, you could uh, the dynamics of the events in these stories can are composed of both of these kinds of scripts. Um, so then, what we do is uh, so for some subjects, they just listen to the story. We don't tell them anything um, about what is supposed to be going on. Um, but for other subjects, we try to push them to uh, activate a specific script. So, for example, we tell some people that they're going to be a customer experience manager that works for the grocery store. Um, and we tell them some things that are in their job description as this manager, um, right? And so we tell them some things, some specific things to pay attention to, which are related specifically to the grocery store script. Um, and then we tell some other people that um, they're uh, they're hired by the couple to make this scrapbook about the couple's life. And so um, they instead are are supposed to be paying attention only to what's going on with the couple, right? So what we want to see is. To what extent does this change things about how they perceive the story and how they remember it later? So at least one measure of, uh, of story perception is that we ask people to, um, to annotate where they think boundaries in the story are. Um, and people in general um, tend to have some agreement about where event boundaries happen in stories, although there is a lot of variability. Um, so I'm just going to play a, a quick uh, example here of, of six sentences from one of these stories. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how many of these subjects um, are annotating events at each sentence, uh, broken up by which of the primes they've been given. Karina and Simon, both distracted in thought, nearly ran into each other as they walked into the grocery store. She almost dropped the keys she was holding. 
The store they had entered looked like a warehouse with high black ceilings, industrial lights, and large packages of food. In the meat section, Karina and Simon were looking over the same cuts of meat because they were both preparing for barbecues that evening. Simon had wanted to talk to Karina and Karina had wanted to say something to Simon, but they felt embarrassed striking up a conversation with a stranger. Karina mustered the courage, turned to Simon and pointing at a Cornish hen, asked, isn't this meat cute? So you can see that there's some um, disagreement among different subjects that were primed in different ways about where the important transitions in this story are, right? So the grocery, uh, the people that are primed at the grocery script think that when they enter the meat section, that's an important boundary. Um, whereas the people that are primed for this meat cute script um, think that when they first talk to each other, right, uh, with the cheesy pickup line, that's the uh, beginning of a new event. Um, and so this, again, is just a behavioral measure. We're also uh, interested in doing this in the scanner. Um, we're also interested in memory measures. So, um, for example, we can ask people at the end of uh, of listening to many of these stories, we can ask them uh, questions about the stories um, and see the extent to which they get questions right if those questions are related to the script they were primed with versus the one they were not primed with. Um, and again, this is still um, ongoing um, piloting, but we find that at least for most of these stories, we see an effect in the direction that people are better at remembering things uh, if they're consistent with the prime that they were given, right? So we in this final memory part where there we ask them to just try to remember as much as they can um, regardless of what they were primed with um, but we find that people have trouble uh, retrieving this information that was not connected to the prime they were given um, right so what we're interested in is to what extent the dynamics during perception depend on this top-down schema um, and to what extent people's long-term memory organization also depends on this schema um, Okay, that's the end of this first section. Um, if there's any burning questions, I could take them now or I could take them at the end. Um, so, uh, well, there was um, one question which I can read out. Um, uh, some people were asking about um, where the, the, the recall and scanner. So, they asked, do they match patterns of watching the film to patterns of describing it and the algorithm predicts, is that right? So maybe you can just go through that again. Sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm obviously skimming over a lot of the details here, but um, yes, yeah, so the way we, there's, and there's actually a bunch of different ways to run this model as well. Um, but the simplest way is to, um, yeah, you take the data from perception where we, um, we've designed these, these stimuli to have events that occur at specific time points. And so, um, we can measure these average event patterns. So we can get, um, for example, across all the restaurants, we can say, what does event one tend to look like in terms of its spatial pattern of activity? Um, and then what we can do is we can go look in the recall data, right? So we have these, these time courses in the recall. Um, they're not labeled about exactly when the transitions are occurring. Um, and we can ask, do we see this same sequence of, uh, of spatial patterns that we saw during perception, do we see them reappear in that same order during recall? Um, and so that's what we can use this model for. We give it these, uh, we give it these time series, we give it these patterns to look for, and it will try to identify: can it find these patterns in the data here? Um, right, and that's and that's basically what the model is is using um, when it's making these judgments, right, of which story and schema you're in. Um, it's trying to figure out the extent to which it can find these sequences in recall. Um, yeah, let me, um, there was a question about the, uh, about the OHBM, um, tutorial. So this is actually part of, a uh, a larger set of tutorials, um, which that you should definitely check out the whole bunch on naturalistic data analysis. Um, so yeah, I'll paste the link here to the event segmentation one. Um, this again was developed as part of OHBM, but this is just freely available. Um, and so there's, um, oh, yep. Yeah, we've got, <laughs> uh, great. So um, uh, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, goes walks through some of the ways uh, to use this model. There's also um, an older version of, of a tutorial that's on the Brainiac website as well, but um, this one we just put together has sort of the most up-to-date ways of ways that we're uh, fitting the model. Okay, great. So um, 
I'm going to move on now to um, talking about other kinds of, of schemas that um, we think share very similar kinds of structures and similar neural uh, substrates as these narrative event scripts, um, but are composed of different kinds of pieces. Um, so th there's been interest for a very long time in thinking about how we can use schemas to improve our memory. Um, and so there's this great book by Ed Cook, um, who's uh, someone he, uh, he has this company called Memrise and has for a long time been interested in um, how we can improve people's memorization skills. Um, and so he talks about memory by saying, the trick of remembering is to make sure that your memory, uh, a slothful creature prone to taking time out to do the mental equivalent of texting itself at the back of the class, sits up and takes notice. Um, and so in this book, he describes a technique, which is an, an ancient technique for trying to build memories, um, which is called the method of loci. And this is a way for um, turning information you want to remember into a series of images that you can associate with a spatial schema. Uh, this is also called a memory palace technique. Yes, hello there, everyone. Okay, why don't you go ask that for help, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, people have been interested in this technique for a long time. Um, what we've been trying to do is figure out a way to actually uh, use brain analysis techniques, right, to, to look at brain activity. Um, and so uh, what we did is we, um, we recruited a, a subject. Uh, usually we don't reveal subject information, but in this case, he actually uh, asked us to reveal who he was. <laughs> um, and uh, this, uh, this person, Paul, Mer Paul Meller, has, um, has been trained in these kinds of memory expert techniques for a long time um, and actually uses them to teach seminars, um, for example, to people like lawyers that are trying to memorize their opening and closing arguments. And um, so what he has is he has these spatial schemas in his head. Um, the one I'm showing here uh, is based on an old uh, athletic field where his kids used to practice sports. Um, and so he has this, this map in his head, the spatial schema in his head of this real life location. Um, and he's placed down on this, uh, on this map some markers um, for places see that he can put pieces of information. Um, and so we had him do in the scanner, um, we had him mentally walk through these, uh, these locations in his mind. Uh, we then had him take two digit numbers and encode them into positions uh, here on, in this grid. Uh, we had him walk back through and recall the numbers. Um, and finally, we had him try to forget the numbers. And so um, he, we had him here for, and we had him at Princeton for a couple of days doing this. Um, and so we got lots of examples of him walking through this map. Um, and so this is uh, ongoing work uh, with my postdoc advisor, Ken Norman, as well as Rolando. Um, so one thing we look for is, uh, are there brain regions that have consistent patterns of activity that are specific for each of these locations, that as uh, Paul is walking through each of these locations, uh, we see the same sequence of activity patterns in these regions. Um, and so we found, um, again, some similar regions uh, to what we had just been looking at with the narrative schemas, again, a lot of these default mode regions. Um, but interestingly, we also see a lot of, of visual cortex activity um, throughout pretty much all of, of visual cortex that's showing these location-specific uh, patterns of activity. Um, this was pretty surprising to us. Um, there's no visual stimulation here. He's just sitting in the dark, walking through this in his mind. Um, but this does suggest that uh, perhaps one thing that's, thing that's helpful here is um, that he's able to uh, construct this kind of rich mental imagery of this imaginary map. Um, so we can, uh, again, use the hidden markup model approach to try to figure out, uh, to try to track his walks through these locations. So again, we have these templates of what we think brain activity looks like at each of these locations on the map. Um, and when we can take one of his walks and we can um, try to map where he is along this route by using a hidden markup model that's looking for this sequence of activity. Um, so I'm gonna play a brief clip here of him just walking through a few of these locations. Um, at this stage, he's recalling numbers um, and he has a system that every two digit number gets converted into an object. So you'll, you'll hear him say some of what the objects are um, he's, so he's mentally walking through, trying to remember what the objects are that he placed at each location. Um, the circles at the bottom are the probability outputs from this hidden Markov model that are trying to guess where along the chain he currently is. Three nine is the first number. There's a map on the turn of my car. It's following the map of the car. I go to the cup holder and there are sunglasses. Eight nine is the next number. There's sunglasses all over the cup holder. I open the trunk in two, three. There are gnomes coming out of the trunk. Two, three. 
I go to the school of the famous and it'd be shut up at 7 2. It's the next number. The school is shut up at 7 2. I go to that chain and I'm surfing 8 3 is the next number. The surfboards on that. I go to the bleachers of my friend Tom Howes, 5 4 is the next number. I see 5 4. The electrical unit is 1 1. There's toads and frogs all, all over the electrical unit. I go to the I go to the drink closet, there's a file, 8-5 is that number. There's a file all over the drink closet. Right, so what you can uh, you can hear is that he's uh, right. He's using this this mental map that he's uh, that he's used for a very long time. Um, he's using this as a kind of recall aid, right, to pull out these items that he's associated with each of these uh, locations along the map. Um, and so we're uh, we're interested in first of all, can we build models of what's happening here? Um, most current computational models of memory don't include this kind of uh, schema or cognitive map. Um, and we're also interested in how this develops. So you can teach this technique uh, to anyone. It doesn't seem like it requires any kind of special brain circuitry to be good at this. Um, and so as people get better and better at this recall procedure, um, what's happening as they're consolidating this map? Uh, we're also working on a related project um, in which we're teaching people a memory palace that's not just in their minds, but is actually in virtual reality. Um, so Rolando created, created this really cool uh, memory palace in VR. It's sort of like this huge museum. And um, it has a sort of complicated map with lots of different rooms. And so, uh, for example, here's Rolando um, in, the, in our VR room at, at Princeton, um, who's currently exploring uh, some of the, the pieces of this, uh, of this palace. So um, you, you can walk around, uh, but most of your, your transportation is uh, you do these little teleport hops to get around. Um, so we can teach people this, uh, this palace. People learn it pretty quickly, even though it's quite large with a lot of rooms. Um, and after people have learned this schema, we bring them in the next day um, and then have them go back through the memory palace. Um, and this time, we present objects in each of the rooms. So um, here, this T-Rex this was not in the room the first day. Uh, this tricycle was not in the room the first day. right? So they're walking through, and they're now seeing um, objects that are in each of the rooms. Um, again, very analogous to the kind of a memory palace method of loci technique. Um, only here, we're, we're not asking people to generate these on their own, right? They're just experiencing these objects that are in these virtual locations. Um, so then after they're done in VR, we move them down the hallway into the scanner. Um, and in the scanner, we have them do a number of tasks, one of which is that we ask them to recall objects along specific routes, right? So we, we tell them to start in one room and walk along a, a path of connected rooms, recalling the objects along the way. Um, and so then what we can ask is, are there brain regions, for example, that track where they are within this palace? Um, and so um, this, is, uh, this is still um, ongoing work, but we uh, find a number of regions. Um, again, these regions in posterior medial cortex around retrosplenial cortex, as well as hippocampal cortex um, that are specific to each of these rooms that people are thinking about, right? And these, uh, these are places, these lit up places are places where we can track people um, just using their brain activity, we can track where they're mentally walking through this map. Um, and so we think this paradigm gives us a great way to look at interactions between schematic and episodic memory. Um, right? They have this, this uh, initial schema that we then layer these episodic objects on top of. Um, and we're also interested, again, in, in predicting behavioral performance. So um, can we say something about, for example, if your, your brain is doing a good job transitioning between these locations, does that mean you're more likely to correctly remember the objects? Uh, there's another VR experiment. This is with my, uh, my PhD, PhD student, Hannah Tartestol, who's also co-advised by Miriam Alley. And um, in this experiment, we, uh, we again have people going through these, um, these rooms in virtual reality. Um, but here, we're interested in whether people can understand context-specific schemas. Um, so people learn the sequence of rooms. Um, there's actually 16 rooms in the full design. And uh, we, we teach them that there's a certain um, set of transitions they can experience between these rooms. Um, in this case, they're not physically walking between the rooms where they're being teleported, as I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, but here, there's in fact, there's actually not just one map. There's actually two. So there's a green route. That's one sequence of transitions between the rooms. And there's a blue route, which is a different sequence of transitions between the rooms. Um, so for example, this is what it looks like when we're teaching people this. So um, here, they're starting in this, this room that's uh, like a fancy apartment. Um, they can look around for a while. And then these 
these spheres light up. Um, and if they touch these spheres, it'll teleport them to another room. So touching the green sphere teleports them to these uh, this row of, of houses in a field. Um, and then again, touching the next sphere will take them farther along the, the path. Um, so this is the green, right? They touch the green spheres. This is, this is one set of transitions. Um, if they're in that same apartment and when the spheres pop up, if they instead touch the blue sphere, that will teleport them to a different location. And so um, this is part of, uh, right? This takes some, some practice, but um, people are again, pretty good at this. We encourage them to do things like construct narratives about why these rooms are connected in this way. Um, but people can learn these uh, these different paths, right? Of of both the green and blue of what's coming up next, both along the green and blue paths. Um, and so um, again, we find people are pretty good at this. Um, so overall, uh, their overall accuracy uh, is high. The x-axis on this plot on these plots here are about steps into the future of prediction. So if we ask them uh, about rooms that are coming up one step, two, three, or four steps in the future, they're um, they're quite good at answering all of those questions. Um, they are a bit slower at answering f questions farther into the future, um, which suggests to us that, again, they're using some kind of internal map here, right, that requires them to mentally simulate out into the future to figure out uh, what's happening four steps down the road. Um, and so we, uh, we're partway through um, collecting scanning data, scanning data for this, um, asking, what brain regions can contain representations of these rooms? Um, are the brain regions that are context sensitive versus non-sensitive? Um, and we also have a manipulation here where we actually change some of the paths during the experiment um, to figure out how brain regions update the representations of these paths. Um, so th there's been uh, some work in the field looking at um, not just spatial schemas, but other kinds of more conceptual schemas um, that we could still think of as maps, but they're not maps um, in, in of spatial locations anymore. Um, so for example, you could think about constructing a semantic space um, where if we take, say, all the words in the English language, um, maybe we could arrange them so that words with similar meanings are close to one another. So we could have um, a bunch of words that are related to food, for example, are all close to each other in this space. Um, right, and so this is a map. It doesn't correspond to a physical location, but um, it still has these kind of properties that things nearby are more similar. Um, and you could imagine traveling between these locations um, and interpolating between them. Um, and so what we were interested in doing is, can we think of a way to teach people paths in a more conceptual space? Um, and this is a project with my PhD student, Matt Siegelman. Um, we wanted to do this, again, trying to do this in some sort of naturalistic way, right? What's a, uh, a kind of natural stimulus that would take you through paths in semantic space? Um, and so what we came up with is poetry. And um, in fact, Matt created this really cool tool called Poe, um, where you give it a sequence of locations, a sequence of these landmarks in semantic space, and it can actually generate poetry that goes between these landmarks. Uh, so I'm going to show a couple examples of this of this poetry, um, and you can try to to see where what uh, what semantic locations it's going through. On the left, deployed the Spanish vanguard with the cavalry in ready charge. Some defenders were annihilated, while some captives were evacuated. In the summer, some serene sunflowers bloomed here during brilliant sunshine showers. When a sudden streak of lightning blew, the grass below emerged opaque with dew. We shall always pray and ever bless all that none may yet perhaps possess. Thereby he shall become a perfect saint as all the faithful shall again acquaint. All right, and here's another, uh, another of the many dangers of fighting for the mounted river rangers. Take advice on how to safely grapple with a determined foe in open battle. Watch the fleeting beauty in the flow of the countless colors of the rainbow. Then behold the deeper shades of darker, blue as if revealed in gleaming armor. When the fallen angel had departed, the greatest wisdom was indeed imparted. The Messiah made no promises to offer his celestial services. 
So we have people um, listen to a very large number of these poems. Um, at first, people don't see that there's any pattern to them. Um, but eventually, we, we teach them about this schema. So for example, in these two poems, um, they all start with um, a kind of military theme and then switch to a color and landscape theme, um, and finally to a religion theme. Um, and so in the actual, the actual poems, um, there's a, a sequence of 10 different topics that um, always appear in the same order, although um, where you start along these 10 topics is different. So there's a big uh, circular list of topics. Um, and uh, again, we have a lot of, of questions we're hoping to answer with this data set, but um, one of them is thinking about what happens to people's brain responses after they know this schema, right? So we can, after they've learned this topic sequence and are able to predict upcoming topics, <clears throat> um, we can ask what their brain responses look like. Um, for example, does it, uh, are they incorporating this prediction information into their responses to these topics in some way? Uh, so one way we're trying to capture that is by using machine learning models. Um, so what we're, we're doing is we're taking natural language processing models. Um, we're specifically right now using LSTMs, if you know what those are. Um, but these are basically models that can capture statistical structure in text. And so um, one of these models we train on stanzas in scrambled order. So this model has seen many, many poems, but there's no specific semantic order to the poems. Um, so this model learns about things like, um, it, well, first of all, learns what the rough topics are. Uh, it learns about things like syllable and rhyming structure, um, but it doesn't know anything about this, this underlying schema. Um, then we can train another model where we actually have the poems in the same intact order that they were shown to the, to the human subjects. Um, and this model is able to um, figure out the semantic uh, sequence so for example, you can see that this model is not surprised when the semantic topic shifts because it's already expecting it. Uh, so then what we can do is we can use representational similarity analysis to ask in these models, um, what stanzas do they think are similar to each other and what, what's the structure of that similarity? Um, and then we can look in any given brain region and ask, does it have the same structure as one of these two models? Um, or which of these two models is a better explanation of the structure in this brain region? Um, and what we find is that the answer is different in different regions. So um, for example, we, uh, again, this, there's no visual stimulation here, but we see uh, robust uh, representations of topic in visual cortex, which again, we think is related to visual imagery. Um, but these, uh, these topics, these representations back here are well modeled by the, stands, by the scrambled model, right? So um, in the visual cortex of the brain here, there's either no difference between the models or maybe the scrambled model is even a little bit better. Um, at predicting the, the structure of representations in this region. Um, but in other regions, so for example, in medial prefrontal cortex, we really need the model that has this intact order in order to model what's going on there. Um, that this medial prefrontal cortex seems like it is doing something that's not just about the current topic, but is actually related to this whole schema of the topic sequence. Um, this is also the region that, we, that shows the biggest difference pre to post learning and the biggest reorganization of topic structure. Um, so we're interested in looking at how this reorganization happens, pre and post learning, um, the, what impact does this have during perception, um, and what impact does this have during prediction? So we have people doing explicit prediction of upcoming topics, um, and which brain regions are, do we think are connected to that behavior? Um, okay, this, this last section is short, so maybe I'll just go through this last part and then we can get to questions. Um, so, uh, these are these are um, two of my these are my two kids looking at uh, reading some books together, um, and right what we're what I'm really curious in uh, is how um, uh, so a post lab Samantha Cohen has been using data that's been collected by the Child Mind Institute um, to try to look at how we see changes um, in different brain regions as kids are learning about the world, um, and so. Uh, at least one of the approaches we're taking here, um, what we can do is look at an individual uh, subjects. We can look at what their brain activity is in some voxel um, and compare that across all the other kids. Um, this is just measuring inner subject correlation, right? What's the time course correlation of the response to a movie in some region in the brain? Um, and we see, um, in general, we see quite good inner subject correlation in this, uh, in this data set that um, so kids are, are kids as young as five are looking at the movie and exhibiting um, similar kinds of responses. Um, but what we're really interested in is are there brain regions in which these responses are changing? So we can order children by age 
um, and for example, divide them up into age bins and look at how correlated responses are between younger and older children. And we're specifically interested in regions where um, this correlation is lower than you'd expect, uh, right? This correlation is lower than you'd expect based on just the noise within the groups. Um, and so we, again, find a number of uh, regions where this is true. And the most interesting one is really up around um, sort of angular gyrus and the temporal parietal junction, uh, where we see that there's a consistent response in the young kids and there's a consistent response in the old kids, but it's different between those two age groups. Um, and so we're investigating now trying to explain what is changing right between the older and younger kids. Um, again, we don't think it's something that's just about attention because the younger kids do have some consistent response. It's just different than what the older children are, are experiencing. Um, and so one thing we've tried to look at is what their pattern dynamics look like. Um, so uh, for example, I'm gonna show some data here from this angular gyrus region. Um, one way we in my lab like to look at these kind of dynamics is in these time point, time point correlation plots. So what we do is take every pair of time points. This is during a one minute clip from this 10 minute movie. And we can measure how similar are the, the spatial patterns of activity between these pairs of time points. Um, and what you can see along the diagonal here is this kind of blocky structure. Um, and the white lines here are actually outlining the output of a HMM model that's looking for this kind of blocky structure. Uh, and a block means that all of these time points uh, that, are, that are nearby to each other here all have very similar spatial patterns, right? That indicates that there's some kind of space, some kind of stable representation that's happening over the course of here, this is about 20 seconds of stable activity um, that then suddenly shifts to a new pattern of activity. So here I'm showing this correlation matrix for the younger children. Um, and on the top, I'm gonna show the correlation for the older children. And so you can see these are pretty symmetrical. So the younger and older kids are roughly doing similar stuff, um, but there are some important differences. So for example, um, if you look off diagonal here, you can see that for these two events, the older children think that they're similar and the older children think they're very dissimilar. Um, something else we've, we've uh, looked at is timing differences. So uh, for example, here you can see that um, the exact time at which this event starts is actually shifted forward in time um, by a few seconds for the older children. Um, and so we're doing this in a much more systematic way across the brain. And this is just uh, sort of an example of, of the kinds of things that we're looking for. Um, so I'm gonna play one last uh, video clip example here. Um, showing you what this movie looks like. This is from the movie Despicable Me. Um, so you can see what this event structure looks like. So while you sleep, we are apart. Your mommy loves you with all her heart. The end, okay, good night. Wait. What? What about goodnight kisses? No, no, no. There will be no kissing or hugging or kissing. He's not going to kiss us goodnight, Agnes. I like him. He's nice. But scary. Like Santa. Only four hours till the launch. Um, so again, yet um, Sam is in the process of um, writing up the final results for this paper now, which we, we're, uh, we think are really exciting. Um, we've also started a new experiment. This is a collaboration with Nim Tottenham, who's a developmental psychologist at Columbia. And um, one of the uh, one of the things that Nim studies is the impact that um, early childhood traumas can have on childhood development. Um, and so specifically, uh, she has a large population of, of subjects in an ongoing study looking at um, unstable caregiving relationships early in life. And so um, what we've, uh, we've kind of uh, just added on to this big ongoing study um, by showing these children some, uh, some video clips. And so, um, for example, we have these clips here uh, from, from two different movies with this schema of, um, of a kind of protector leaving and coming back. Um, and what we're interested in, in here is both how these responses change with age, as well as they, uh, how they might depend on the child's specific experiences, um, right? So these schemas are built up not uniformly in all kids across time, 
Um, but this is an example of a data set where we actually have a, a population of children with different experiences that we could try to link to learning different kinds of schema structures. All right, uh, that takes me to the end and it uh, looks like there's some questions. So I'm, I'm happy to go through some. Okay, great. Thanks um, very much. Chris, I'll, I'll, I'll clap in the name of everybody else, uh, but you guys can clap on the chat. Um, yeah, so we have quite a few questions. Um, I again encourage everybody to um, vote on the questions uh, as I will first ask the uh, top voted questions. So, uh, and I'll invite um, you guys, if you do not want to ask a question and you want me to ask it for you, just uh, say on the chat. Um, yeah, so thanks again. This was like an incredible um, talk, really, really interesting. Uh, so, Isabel, I'm inviting you now to ask your question. Well, for some reason, I am not managing to ask you. I don't know why, so I will ask the question. Um, so uh, the question is, how do you relate this to a broader theoretical context of cognitive processes? Uh, would you relate this to hierarchical predictive processing, uh, where we compress events into higher level abstract schemas that are sort of event stereotypes that help us predict and process new, new events? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Yeah, that's, that's basically exactly how I think about it. And so, um, yeah, I think there's yeah there's uh, a, a bunch of things I could say. So um, yeah, one is that I think these schemas are really important for hierarchical processing, which is that um, as you're especially at these sort of higher levels of of cognition, when you're really trying to put together the pieces of these events, um, these schemas are providing you a way to uh, take all of the kind of stream of perceptual information you're getting um, and then attach it into these event memories, and um, when you, I think this is part of the reason why these regions I'm so interested in don't usually show up in um, like simpler, better controlled kinds of, uh, of experiments. So uh, if you just have flashing images on the screen, for example, um, that don't fit a particular schema, um, these higher level regions really don't have that much to, to do in that case. And so um, I think there's a lot of interesting questions about how this kind of, uh, if you have stimuli that conform to a schema versus don't about differences and how those get compressed and represented. Um, there's also another brain region that I didn't mention at all in this talk is the hippocampus, but is also something I'm very interested in. Um, and I suspect that the hippocampus actually does some quite different things in these kinds of stimuli compared to the kind of flashing random images stimuli, because um, in some ways the hippocampus can do a lot less work here, right? That a lot of your understanding is really bootstrapped on top of these schemas. Um, and so it's possible that it actually behaves in a different way. And that's that's something we're interested in too. Cool. So that was actually uh, the next question, oh. <laughs> um, uh, which is very nice, which was asked by myself. So I'll, I'll, I, I won't invite myself to the screen. Um, uh, yeah, do, do you have anything else? Uh, like, so so you always show these surface maps. Um, uh, so we don't know what's happening in the campus. So, um, so, so you just said now, what do you think should, should or might happen? But uh, I was wondering what do you actually see in the in the in these effects, like for, for the effects, yeah. hippocampus yeah. and, and adjacent um, uh, medial temporal lobe um, structures. And and is there is there a difference um, between uh, what they do in these uh, more spatial embedded schemas and semantic schemas? Right. Yeah, so we do. So, uh, for example, with these kind of schematic patterns here, yeah, I don't have it on the on the slide, but the hippocampus does also show this effect. It's not super strong, but it does show a significant um, effect of having consistent scheme uh, event patterns for schemas. Um, in in general, though, uh, we've actually found that the the hippocampus doesn't seem to have this kind of block like structure that we see that's really all over the place in the cortex. So this this kind of structure where um, the, there's many places in the cortex that have this kind of structure where the patterns stay constant for a little while and then shift. Um, I, I have not seen that in any of our data in the hippocampus. And I, I, as far as I know, people have not seen that for this kind of naturalistic data. Um, and so where the hippocampus seems to be doing something that's much more sparse. Um, and 
I mean, yeah, it could be that it's really dealing with um, a lot of these non-schematic pieces, right? It's really dealing with the episode-specific information, um, which is coming in tiny little chunks. It's not responsible for uh, for building up these kind of schematic responses. Um, but yeah, I think we still have a lot more to do. We're also part of this this developmental project is also looking at changes in hippocampal response. Um, even the youngest kids, the five-year-olds in this data set, have a very consistent hippocampal response that's consistent within their age group. And so um, we think there's there's a, definitely a lot going on there that we, we still don't totally understand. Cool, thanks. Um, uh, so the next question uh, is by Sophia. Um, I'm going to invite you to the screen if you want. Okay, I think uh, Sophia doesn't want to. So I'll I'll read the question. Um, uh, ah, no, here she comes. Yeah, great. Hi. Um, I was <laughs> just wondering, in with the construction of the virtual reality environments, um, have you did you notice any interaction between distal cues versus near field cues in the development of schemas? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So the so for the VR. Um, environment we yeah purposely constructed so there are distal cues you can't see them from all of the rooms so a lot of the palace is kind of indoors um but the uh yes yeah, so i could uh, oh i'm not sure anymore but um yeah so it's uh yeah the uh let's see yeah can i uh can really can off can can can. <laughs> okay um so uh yeah, so a lot of the, the rooms are kind of indoors, but you can see, like, for example, here, there's like rooms with big windows that you can see distal cues. Um, so yeah, we haven't we haven't tried to pull them apart in a careful way, which, um, yeah, is a, at least for like sort of traditional navigation experiments is something people def always typically try to do, right, is pull apart these cues. Um, here, we, we sort of gave up on controlling the room specific features and instead just threw like every possible feature we could. And so there's distal cues, there's proximal cues, um, there's, uh, yeah, if you've seen some of these rooms, so um, we, uh, yeah, we, we tried to vary like room sizes. Um, there's this, the last room in this example here is like this weird hallway with pictures of cats on the walls. So like um, we basically, the, the goal was to make the rooms as different as possible. Um, we sort of, we're, we're, mo we're basically giving up control over to say which of these features are driving the brain representations. Um, our main goal here is to get some kind of distinctive pattern for each room that's gonna allow us to track people during recall. Um, and so, yeah, we sort of, we've sort of given up on having enough power to really say which features of the room are driving it. Got it, cool. Uh, do you have any intention of starting to dial down into that in future work? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of the stuff we're doing now really is like pretty exploratory and um, we're trying to just get some ideas of what the right directions are. Um, yeah, I mean, one one thing I'm definitely interested in is, uh, you know, we see um, lots of different regions that have representations for these locations. And so they're almost certainly representing different things. And so starting to try to pull apart, like, which features are driving which regions would be really interesting. That's really cool. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, and the next question, um, I will ask this one again. Um, so are the VR or memory palace uh, experiments meant to tell us something about how schemas naturally work in the brain or is it validating the effectiveness of a specific memory technique? Yeah, that's a good question. That, that comes up often when we talk about the memory expert stuff. Um, so I am, uh, yeah, I am, interested to some extent in the memory technique itself, but really I just see this as a test bed for um, a way to get people to uh, move through naturalistic um, schemas in a way that's experimentally testable. Um, so yeah, these memory experts, our hypothesis at least, is that they're basically just using the same kind of neural circuitry that we do for regular autobiographical experiences. Um, they're just really good at engaging it for these kinds of nonsense things like like streams of two digit numbers, um, right? And so that's our hope at least is that what they're doing is they're just making use of the same kind of schema machinery that we usually use. Um, and so, uh, but because they're so good at sort of um, turning it off and on and they can do it in, in sort of on command in these sequences, um, that makes them a really interesting test group to study that um, it gives us a way to uh, provide at least some experimental control of 
how people are attaching things to these schemas. Um, so yeah, I would say we haven't totally proven that that's the case yet, but at least the kinds of, um, right? So for example, the kinds of brain regions that we see um, our pilot subject using here, um, right? A lot of these, these hotspots um, are similar to the kinds of things that we see when people are um, doing, remembering actual autobiographical, spatial autobiographical memories, right? And so um, that's our hope is that they haven't, it's, this memory technique is not some sort of like weird polar trick, but is actually just um, a way that they're learning to um, take arbitrary information and then engage these naturalistic systems. Cool, thank you. Um, next question is by Antonis. Um, I will ask the question for him. So that uh, relates more to the first section of the talk. Uh, it's a technical question. Um, do you do you do any analysis on the free recall speech, as in, uh, do you analyze the quality of a verbal recall um, quantitatively? Yeah, so um, I didn't include this in the uh, the schema uh, narrative section here, but so we um, so when people are are doing these recalls, um, we're it is it's really important to us that we connect what's going on in the brain to people's actual behavior, and so. Um, figuring out what to do with these recalls is a little challenging. They're obviously totally unstructured. And so um, one thing we've done is construct rubrics. So we basically make a list of all the possible things someone could say about this story. And then you get this uh, person gets a point for everything they mentioned about the story. Um, this is pretty uh, laborious because there's there's th there's 30 people each recalling 16 stories and we wanted to have multiple people do the ratings. So um, this took quite a long time for us to get these. But so that's one measure we use. Um, another measure we've started using is based on tools from natural language processing. Um, there are these word embedding approaches, which is basically a way of converting every word into a vector such that words with similar meanings have similar vectors. Um, and so what we can do is look where in general people are in vector space. Um, and we can use this to get a measure of how schematic someone's response is. So if someone says um, lots of words that are related to restaurants, for example, um, we'd say that they have a very restaurant heavy response. And so we can um, also get this, this kind of schema score of how schematic is their response. And so we've then been looking at um, connecting the kind of neural results we're seeing, right? So when we look at results like this of asking, um, right, we're, we're seeing reactivation of perceptual patterns during retrieval. Um, we can ask is the extent to which that retrieval is successful neurally, does that predict um, these rubric scores, so does it predict story specific details in the in the uh, recall, um, or does it predict these kinds of schematic responses in the recall, right? That there's just saying lots of restaurant specific restaurant general words, um, and so uh, yeah, again, this we're sort of finishing this up now, but um, the answer is that it's definitely both. Um, a lot of these uh, uh, there's also a sort of general trade off where some regions seem more sort of schema related and others are more story related. Um, definitely the strongest relationship is in this uh, posterior medial cortex region, um, which again is sort of retrospinal uh, cortex, PCC, precuneus, um, that in these regions, if you see strong reactivation, that also correlates with getting a high score on these behavioral rubrics. Um, so yeah, figuring out the right ways to quantify these recalls is uh, can be challenging, but um, this is really, to, to us, this is a way of sort of validating all the neural stuff is showing that it actually connects to behavior. Great, thank you. Um, uh, the next question is by Helen Barron. Um, I will invite Helen to, to the screen. If you want to come. Yeah. Hi, Helen. Hi. Great talk, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, what was my question? <laughs> um, so it was about whether for your um, data right at the end, comparing old and young kids, it looked like the older kids are, have event boundaries earlier than the young ones. So I wondered whether that might reflect an ability to predict what's coming um, better and whether that might relate to some kind of generative model um, that's more developed in the older children. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, yeah, so yeah, so what we've started looking at this in a few ways. Um, we have um, an echo from Helen, might be because of 
Uh, maybe you need to mute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, again, this is just sort of one particular example. We, yeah, we have found a number of brain regions where this is true across the whole movie that the older kids are uh, starting their events a little earlier than the younger kids. And um, so, yeah, there's a few different interpretations of that. So one possibility is that, um, as you mentioned, is that the older kids are predicting. So they're able to tell before the event switches, they're able to tell that this event is about to end and they can start predicting what's happening next. Um, another possibility is that when the event shifts on screen, the older kids are much faster to react than the younger kids, right? So the older, and again, it could have to do with, it could also have to do with prediction that the older kids are like prepared that the event is about to end. And so it's easy for them to switch. Whereas the younger kids, it's hard. Um, so with fMRI, it's a little hard to distinguish between those two things given the, the temporal resolution that we have, but um, we do at least have some evidence that, uh, that some of this anticipation is is actually true um, prediction in the sense that it's happening before the event is changing on screen. Um, but it's probably some combination of, of both of those things that um, that the the older children also are like they're um, they're better able to predict uh, that there's going to be a change, even if they don't know what the change is going to be, right? They have this better expectation that uh, about that this scene seems like it's about over and a new thing is coming, and i'm I'm ready for it to happen. Thanks. Thanks. Um, great. Next question um, is uh, ah, well, I'm just jumped here. Uh, 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 next one is by Robert. Um, I'll invite him to the screen. One sec. Um, okay, I'll, I'll ask a question in the meantime. It doesn't seem to work. Um, could you possibly speculate on the relevance of your... Ah, well, I think my well, question just disappeared. Ah, here it is. Could you possibly speculate on the relevance of your um, TPJ finding uh, in all the versus younger kids? Um, could this be related to the development of social cognition and perspective, uh, uh, sorry, per perspective taking skills. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as the, I think there's many, many advantages to using these kind of naturalistic stimuli, but one of the downsides is that it can be hard afterward to say, right, what, what was it in the movie that drove these kids um, to have different responses um, in this region? So um, one thing we can do is look at which pieces of the movie are the most different um, to try to see if this correlates, for example, with um, with making inferences in social situations. Um, this clip from Despicable Me does is primarily social interactions. Um, and it's it's some sort of complicated ones where Gru, the, the main character slash villain, is um, feeling uh, conflicted about whether to give up the girls that he's adopted. And so um, that, that would certainly be our guess um, that it's related to um, this better kind of social um, cognition, maybe better social prediction. Um, it's, uh, again, even the younger kids show consistent responses in this region. So it's not that it's not doing anything or that's doing something very idiosyncratic. But um, yeah, that's my, my guess is that the kind of schemas that are relevant for this region are going to be about social interactions. Can you remind, can you, uh, that's my question, can you remind um, uh, what are the ages of the young and old uh, groups? Sure, yeah, yeah, so they, um, they the youngest kids are are five, the oldest kids are about 18 or 19, so you <laughs> might not count and all the kids anymore. Um, the, yeah, the age distribution in this data set also is not totally uniform, although we, from many of these analyses, we force it, we resample it to force it to be uniform. Um, but yeah, this is a this is a very large data set that with hundreds of, of kids that have these movie this movie data, um, and so yeah, a lot of what we're interested in really is stuff happening sort of between the ages like maybe eight and twelve is where we see a lot of the biggest changes. Cool, thank you. And the next question is by um, uh, Roberto. Um, I've uh, asked you to the screen. Uh, but I'm not sure he's around anymore. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, I'll ask for him. Um, are the event boundaries 
uncovered by the HMM based on neural data distinct from what a statist statistical learning algorithm might uncover from natural statistics of the videos themselves? Is cognition really necessary to find these event boundaries? Yeah, so I think in, in some brain regions, it's absolutely true that the event structure you're seeing is 100% just inherited from the stimulus itself. So um, in early visual cortex, for example, you get um, a very nice kind of blocky structure, but the blocks are really tiny and they um, they relate to things like camera angle changes and things like that, right? So that kind of blockiness is not super interesting in the sense that it's just blockiness that exists in the stimulus. Um, but in these higher level regions, these blocks are really much longer than the kinds of, for example, visual statistics you would see, right? So um, right in this middle scene here, for example, right, is over the course of about 20 seconds. There's mo there's many camera angle changes. There's big lighting changes as the lights turn on and off, for example. And so um, we think that in order to construct these much longer events um, does require you to understand sort of when there's a meaningful difference in the stimulus, right? And so that's something that, that relies heavily on cognition. Um, and so, yeah, I think that something with these event boundaries, like the hard part is not finding boundaries because there's many, many boundaries in the stimulus. The hard part is knowing which boundaries to ignore, right? What are the changes that are happening in the sensory environment that shouldn't destabilize your representation, right? They're not meaningfully changing your understanding of the situation. Yeah, thanks. Um, next question is from uh, Roni, I'll ask. Um, has event segmentation been applied to autobiographical uh, recall? Is there meaningful significance to better segmentation of one's own memories? Yeah, um, good, good question. I haven't done this myself. Um, I believe there's some work on this like in, uh, that looks at memories and aging um, that uh, shows that um, one of the things that's associated with, with memory decline is um, a failure to properly uh, structure autobiographical memories into events. Um, and so I, I don't know if there's a clear answer about exactly what's the cause and effect there, but um, there, yeah, there's at least some work looking at how people structure these kinds of recalls. Um, it can be sometimes um, challenging just from the behavioral recall data to figure out what the right kind of event segmentation is. Um, that's one, it's one reason why we've been using this data-driven approach from the fMRI data, which is that, um, right, we can have it sort of propose where it thinks these neural pattern shifts are happening. Um, but yeah, this is something I'm, I'm really interested in that we're, a lot of the things we're doing, we're kind of trying to simulate uh, what would happen if you really recalled an autobiographical memory, um, but in a, in a setting where we actually know where like everyone is using the same schema or at least some schema we control. Um, but yeah, the, the ultimate goal here is to understand how people are really structuring their real memories. Thanks very much. Um, the next question is by Tim Behrens, um, who was invited to the screen. Tim, you need to accept. Okay, I don't know where he is. Um, I'll ask for Tim. Uh, why do you think only the MPFC predicts the stanza? Uh, ah, there we go. Hi, Tim. Uh, you can ask for me, man. I'm a bit shy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, hi, Chris. It's, uh, it's really cool stuff. Um, yeah, it's like you're inventing new ways to measure things. Um, uh, cool. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure you've thought about this, but it seems to me that often your results in your papers and, and the ones presented today um, don't really get the VMPFC. They focus on, on PCC and other parts of the um, uh, uh, of the DMN, but uh, there's one really striking one you presented today which uh, really only seemed to get the VMPFC, the, this uh, stanza prediction. And so is it something about the time, the length of time scales that are the, the height of the hierarchy, or, or what is it that is getting VMPFC rather than the rest of the DMN? Yeah, so um, yeah, so yeah, for example, right in this work here, we get both these more posterior yeah. regions and, and MPFC, right? And the analysis here is uh, looking for regions that have, like, you know, every time you go through security at an airport, they have a similar pattern, right? Mm -hmm. um, but an another experiment we did in, in that paper is um, we showed uh, videos where 
um, we actually um, scrambled up the orders of the schemas, um, right? So we showed um, we showed like airport movies, but the the order is all messed up. So the security is happening at random times, um, and so in that case, we actually found that only MPFC that that only broke the result in MPFC. It didn't break it in these posterior regions. So the posterior regions seem totally happy to represent the pieces of the schema, mm -hmm. um, right? So they have this generalized response to going through security. But if it have right, if they if going through security happens after you get on your seat, that region is still represents it. Whereas MPFC didn't show the schematic responses in the scrambles. And that's the same in the stanzas. So it seems basically you're basically saying then that the VMPFC is the very top of the hierarchy. Yeah, MPFC. Yeah, that's right. right. That it, at least if you're interested in like how you link together. I think representing the pieces of the schema is also important, but yeah, if the MPFC is really maybe the only region that's actually linking the whole schema together into the real map that you're using. Cool, thanks very much indeed. Can you check me off this now? <laughs> yeah, you can check yourself, I think. Uh, wow. There you go, bye. Um, okay, the next question, we have a couple more. Um, and yeah, we, we have, I guess people can leave if they need to leave. Um, so the next question is, um, how many uh, traversals of the map did the subjects do before being tested on them? Point nine is super impressive for four steps in the future. Yeah, so um, yeah, my uh, me and Miriam's grad student, Hannah, did an incredible job with this project. It, um, it, this is a really hard task because there's, uh, I didn't even show the full design, but there's there's 16 rooms total and you're learning these two routes across the rooms. So for each of these rooms, you have to memorize what are the two things that are coming up next. Um, and you have to be able to like simulate these in your head fast enough that you can answer even up to four steps in the future within a few seconds. Um, so this took a lot of piloting, but we um, now have a strategy for teaching people these, which involves um, having them construct stories about the sequences. So before they even go in VR, there's this pre-session where we have them write stories, um, Hannah criticizes their stories because they're usually not very good and it helps them improve their stories. Um, then they go in VR and they go through the rooms and they also um, get some uh, interspersed with the training are these prediction trials where they have to predict um, which rooms are coming up next. Um, and so, yeah, so after doing all of that, um, we, we do have to exclude some number of subjects, but it's pretty small. So um, maybe something like 10% of subjects are unable to learn within that first session. but. Um, but for everyone else, yeah, they get very good at this. Um, and uh, yeah, this is showing this, these results are showing sort of put after the first day of learning on the second day um, that they're able to do these uh, this task with high accuracy. So uh, yes, it was quite a challenge to get people good at this task. Um, but our, our hope is that because people are so good, um, that does reflect that they're going to be um, creating robust neural signatures of these rooms, which um, yeah, unfortunately with, with the shutdowns, we've only managed to get a few subjects scanned so far on this, but um, we, uh, yeah, we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to see representations of upcoming rooms in the neural data as well. Thanks. Um, and uh, next question is um, from Sarah. I'll ask a question. Uh, in your analyses of neural pattern similarity within and between specific schema events, um, for example, going through security, what makes your analysis different than a similarity analysis of conceptual content? For example, even though the visual information is different across movies, there are conceptual objects shared across the same schematic events. For example, suitcases, escalators, etc. Um, yeah, that's a question. Yeah, so we did, uh, we, we sort of tried to, um, I, I think the answer is is yes, I think that's what we're doing. Um, we tried to push the similarities to be as conceptual as possible. So for example, this is the reason we are, um, many of our analyses are cross modality, right? So we're looking at stuff that generalizes across both videos and audiobooks. So at least the low level features are different. Um, and uh, there's um, there definitely are some shared objects to some extent, but only at a sort of course level, right? So there's there's like a there's food in all the restaurant ones, but it's not never the same food. Um, so yeah, I think when, once you're at that level of, of sort of conceptual similarity, I would consider that part of the schema, right? Is that there's going to be a food that's on the table of some kind. Um, and so uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's I think, that's part of the answer um, is that we're looking at 
we we're considering that stuff part of this the schematic pieces of this. Um, and then the the other answer, um, as I was mentioning to Tim, is that um, we're we're also interested not just in like individual pieces, but also in these sequences, right? So to really be a true schema, we think that you should really have some kind of underlying map, right? So it should be a spatial map or um, this kind of temporal map of the sequence, or for the poetry, it's like a map through semantic space or something, right? That um, you don't really get to, to be a, a schema unless there's some kind of structured association among these pieces. Um, and so, so you're right that like inside one of these pieces might be something like you need to have a suitcase with you, but um, we're also interested in how you link up the whole sequence. Great, thanks. And I think with that, um, we're done for today. Um, thanks very much again for a really fabulous talk. Um, and I'm sure everybody really enjoyed, even though we can't uh, clap aloud. Um, uh, yeah, so Chris, uh, I'm going to send a, a Zoom link if people want to um, to chat with Chris one on one, um, uh, we'll move it over there, and then we'll figure out some kind of structure. Um, we have about an hour for that. Uh, but otherwise, thanks everybody very much for joining, um, and thanks Chris again. Thanks everyone. Great. So I'm going to end the broadcast, and then I'll send the chat. Will still be um, alive, and I'll send the Zoom link on the chat. So thanks everyone again. <laughs>